apostles more than the others. The fact that John was one of the three personal aides of Jesus lent further color to this mistaken idea, not to mention that John, along with his brother James, had known Jesus longer than the others. Peter, James, and John were assigned as personal aides to Jesus soon after they became apostles. Shortly after the selection of the twelve, and at the time Jesus appointed Andrew to act as director of the group, he said to him, And now I desire that you assign two or three of your associates to be with me, and to remain by my side, to comfort me, and to minister to my daily needs. And Andrew thought best to select for this special duty the next three first chosen apostles. He would have liked to volunteer for such a blessed service himself, but the master had already given him his commission, so he immediately directed that Peter, James, and John attach themselves to Jesus. John Zebedee had many lovely traits of character, but one which was not so lovely was his inordinate, but usually well-concealed, conceit. His long association with Jesus made many and great changes in his character. This conceit was greatly lessened, but after growing old and becoming more or less childish, this self-esteem reappeared to a certain extent, so that, when engaged in directing Nathan in the writing of the gospel which now bears his name, the aged apostle did not hesitate repeatedly to refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. In view of the fact that John came nearer to being the chum of Jesus than any other earth mortal, that he was his chosen personal representative in so many matters, it is not strange that he should have come to regard himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, since he most certainly knew he was the disciple whom Jesus so frequently trusted. The strongest trait in John's character was his dependability. He was prompt and courageous, faithful and devoted. His greatest weakness was this characteristic conceit. He was the youngest member of his father's family and the youngest of the apostolic group. Perhaps he was just a bit spoiled. Maybe he had been humored slightly too much. But the John of after years was a very different type of person than the self-admiring and arbitrary young man who joined the ranks of Jesus' apostles when he was twenty-four. Those characteristics of Jesus which John most appreciated were the Master's love and unselfishness. These traits made such an impression on him that his whole subsequent life became dominated by the sentiment of love and brotherly devotion. He talked about love and wrote about love. This son of thunder became the apostle of love. And at Ephesus, when the aged bishop was no longer able to stand in the pulpit and preach, but had to be carried to church in a chair, and when at the close of the service he was asked to say a few words to the believers, for years his only utterance was, My little children, love one another. John was a man of few words, except when his temper was aroused. He thought much, but said little. As he grew older, his temper became more subdued, better controlled, but he never overcame his disinclination to talk. He never fully mastered this reticence, but he was gifted with a remarkable and creative imagination. There was another side to John that one would not expect to find in this quiet and introspective type. He was somewhat bigoted and inordinately intolerant. In this respect, he and James were much alike. They both wanted to call down fire from heaven on the heads of the disrespectful Samaritans. When John encountered some strangers teaching in Jesus' name, he promptly forbade them. But he was not the only one of the twelve who was tainted with this kind of self-esteem and superiority consciousness. John's life was tremendously influenced by the sight of Jesus as going about without a home, as he knew how faithfully he had made provision for the care of his mother and family. John also deeply sympathized with Jesus because of his family's failure to understand him, being aware that they were gradually withdrawing from him. This entire situation, together with Jesus' ever-deferring his slightest wish to the will of the Father in heaven, and his daily life of implicit trust, made such a profound impression on John that it produced marked and permanent changes in his character, changes which manifested themselves throughout his entire subsequent life. John had a cool and daring courage which few of the other apostles possessed. He was the one apostle who followed right along with Jesus the night of his arrest and dared to accompany his master into the very jaws of death. He was present and near at hand right up to the last earthly hour 
and was found faithfully carrying out his trust with regard to Jesus' mother, and ready to receive such additional instructions as might be given during the last moments of the Master's mortal existence. One thing is certain, John was thoroughly dependable. John usually sat on Jesus' right hand when the twelve were at meat. He was the first of the twelve really and fully to believe in the resurrection, and he was the first to recognize the Master when he came to them on the seashore after his resurrection. This son of Zebedee was very closely associated with Peter in the early activities of the Christian movement, becoming one of the chief supporters of the Jerusalem church. He was the right-hand support of Peter on the day of Pentecost. Several years after the martyrdom of James, John married his brother's widow. The last twenty years of his life he was cared for by a loving granddaughter. John was in prison several times, and was banished to the Isle of Patmos for a period of four years until another emperor came to power in Rome. Had not John been tactful and sagacious, he would undoubtedly have been killed, as was his more outspoken brother James. As the years passed, John, together with James the Lord's brother, learned to practice wise conciliation when they appeared before the civil magistrates. They found that a soft answer turns away wrath. They also learned to represent the church as a spiritual brotherhood devoted to the social service of mankind, rather than as the kingdom of heaven. They taught loving service rather than ruling power, kingdom, and king. When in temporary exile on Potmos, John wrote the book of Revelation, which you now have in greatly abridged and distorted form. This book of Revelation contains the surviving fragments of a great revelation, large portions of which were lost, other portions of which were removed, subsequent to John's writing. It is preserved only in fragmentary and adulterated form. John traveled much, labored incessantly, and after becoming bishop of the Asia churches, settled down at Ephesus. He directed his associate, Nathan, in the writing of the so-called Gospel According to John at Ephesus when he was ninety-nine years old. Of all the twelve apostles, John Zebedee eventually became the outstanding theologian. He died a natural death at Ephesus in A.D. 103, when he was 101 years of age. 5. Philip the Curious Philip was the fifth apostle to be chosen, being called when Jesus and his first four apostles were on their way from John's rendezvous on the Jordan to Cana of Galilee. Since he lived at Bethsaida, Philip had for some time known of Jesus, but it had not occurred to him that Jesus was a really great man until that day in the Jordan Valley when he said, Follow me. Philip was also somewhat influenced by the fact that Andrew, Peter, James, and John had accepted Jesus as the Deliverer. Philip was twenty-seven years of age when he joined the Apostles. He had recently been married, but he had no children at this time. The nickname which the Apostles gave him signified curiosity. Philip was always wanting to be shown. He never seemed to see very far into any proposition. He was not necessarily dull, but he lacked imagination. This lack of imagination was the great weakness of his character. He was a commonplace and matter-of-fact individual. When the apostles were organized for service, Philip was made steward. It was his duty to see that they were at all times supplied with provisions, and he was a good steward. His strongest characteristic was his methodical thoroughness. He was both mathematical and systematic. Philip came from a family of seven, three boys and four girls. He was next to the oldest, and after the resurrection he baptized his entire family into the kingdom. Philip's people were fisher folk. His father was a very able man, a deep thinker, but his mother was of a very mediocre family. Philip was not a man who could be expected to do big things, but he was a man who could do little things in a big way, do them well and acceptably. Only a few times in four years did he fail to have food on hand to satisfy the needs of all. Even the many emergency mans attendant upon the life they lived seldom found him unprepared. The commissary department of the apostolic family was intelligently and efficiently managed. The strong point about Philip was his methodical reliability. The weak point in his makeup was his utter lack of imagination, the absence of the ability to put two and two together to obtain four. He was mathematical in the abstract, but not constructive in his imagination. He was almost entirely lacking in certain types of imagination. He was the typical everyday and commonplace average man. There were a great many such men and women among the multitudes who came to hear Jesus teach and preach, 
and they derived great comfort from observing one like themselves elevated to an honored position in the councils of the master. <laughs>